but the emperor has you know has to take the blame himself. You know. You know. Do you do you guys do you write, do you do you realize that the emperor explains more about everything in the entire series of the you know, movies than any everybody else? Because he's the one who knows everything, and he also has to explain everything before you know he kills somebody or tortures somebody. It's like, do you know why I need to torture you? <laughs> 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 no, you don't. Neither does the audience. So <laughs> <laughs> All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I want to show you guys is okay. Row sheet. The second thing I want to show you is Scratch. Okay, this is called the the Scratch um, interface. Um, it's really kind of interesting because uh, you can practice your programming with this particular interface. Okay, there are certain things that we can already do with this. So what I'll do is to spend maybe the first you know 10, 20 minutes or so with this to implement something that we already know how to implement in pseudocode. So for those of you who just who, who just find you know tracing programs by hand extremely boring and tedious, which I, I agree, you know, because grading it is also very dry and boring. But you know, this will give you an opportunity to you know, actually write some programs and see how it works in a in an environment where you don't need to one pay for the software, two, you don't have to learn a programming language. There's no syntax to learn. And three, you know, you can actually do a lot with this particular programming interface. Okay, kids can do this. Okay, you can you can you can ki you can give a child um, a program that's already written, and they can start to modify it and you know play with that program right away. There's no syntax to learn. So let's go ahead and just you know start with this. I'm not going to start with uh, the really basic stuff because I think in this class most of us can explore this stuff you know on our own. And this is also not a required homework, so you don't have to do this. I'm just saying that for people who want to play around with you know programming, this is not a bad you know starting point. <coughs> okay, first of all, where do you get it? To get Scratch, you go to Scratch S C R A T C H dot M I T E D U and go to the download link. Now Scratch, you know, this particular Scratch the Scratch website. It's also in many ways like um, YouTube, except you are not recording your video clip and make it available for other people to view it. You are making your programs and you can upload your programs so other people can play with the games and you know, the, all the entertaining stuff that you have created. So it's a, there's a way to share your code with the rest of the community and also you, know, you can also play with the other you know, programs that other people have written too. Some of these programs are pretty inventive. It's also multimedia based. You can integrate sound and sight into your program. So it's kind of like more like a source forge. The fact that you can download pre filed programs I or also know play with the code. I don't know whether you can download the source code, but you can actually run the programs you know, from you know this interface. Okay. So I I just want to introduce this part to you and then we can switch back to the programming interface. Um, Basically, when you're writing a program in Scratch, you have uh, at least two major components. The background itself is called the stage, and the stage is not passive. The stage is just as active as any other objects in this program. Um, the stage has its own scripts to run. In fact, it can run multiple scripts concurrently if that's what you want it to do. So it can handle and keep track of multiple things in the stage, the stage itself is active. What you're looking at here, this little cat here, this is called a sprite. A sprite is also, you know, an animate can be an animated object. It can run, you know, certain types of programs. But in this class, I will just go ahead and write one single script so that we just, you know, kind of get the hang of it. And you guys can make this a lot more entertaining. You know, you can write fun, you know, type of, uh, you can write interesting programs with this uh, particular. Um, environment. So what I'll do is I'm going to implement something that we already know how to do: finding the maximum of two numbers. Okay. So let's go ahead and how we can do something like that. We go to the control block here, and then we can choose one of these. I'll just go ahead and click this one here. It says when sprite one clicked. 
In other words, when I click this right here, it will start the execution of this program. This is the beginning of a, of a script. And the next thing we'll do, or the next thing I'll do, is I will go to looks here, and I will go, mm, let's see here, maybe sensing. I'll go to sensing, and I'll put this block here. This block says, you know, ask, blah, 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 and wait. And if you want to find out what a particular block does, you can click the block itself from the, you know, selection before you put it into a program. In other words, this is a fully interactive programming environment. You don't have to finish the program and then run it and then see what happens, which is what you will have to do when you take the C, C and C++ programming, pro, uh, programming class. But in this case, you can just click it and it will do exactly what the block is supposed to do, which is asking, you know, what's your name, and then give you a chance to answer the question. And then you can either press the enter key or click the check mark here. But I don't want to ask you what's your name. I want to say ask, um, give me a number, and wait. And then the next thing we'll do is we'll go to variables. It doesn't come with any variables. If you want to have variables, you will have to make your variables. So I'll go ahead and make a variable, and I'll call this using our own naming convention. I'll call this x, just so that it is consistent with our naming convention with that particular algorithm. In this case, I don't need it for all sprites, I just need it for this particular sprite. In other words, you can create additional sprites if you want to. And then I want to change the value. This is our assignment statement. The assignment statement is basically set a particular variable to a particular value. Okay, in this case, we only have one variable. But I don't want it to change it to zero. I want to change it to the answer to the previous question. Did you guys see what I just did? I just dragged the block called answer from the left hand side to the middle part of the set action. And that's how you write programs. It's all drag and drop. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. And then I'll do the same thing with uh, variable y. But I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to do this all over again. So I can separate this block first and then right click on the top and then say duplicate. So that gives me a duplicate of this. And then I can put it back into the program. Except I don't want both of these to use variable x. I go to variables and I change it and say make a new variable. Call it y. And it's only available for this sprite. Click OK. Then I can go back to the program so that when, when I ask for the second number, I will change the prompt first. So I don't want to say give me a number. I'll just say give me another number and wait, and this time I will set the value into variable y. Are we doing okay so far? What have, what have, I, what have I typed so far? Just the prompts, okay? As far as the program is concerned, there's no syntax to learn. It's all done by dragging and dropping. Okay. So now we are actually going into the core part of finding the maximum of two variables. So if you look, to look at this list here, it has a conditional statement, but it also has another conditional statement that has an else, else branch. That's what I need. So I'm going to stick it here. Do you still remember what is the condition of the conditional statement to find the maximum of two variables? A comparison, right? You know, either less than or greater than. So we'll go to operators in that case because comparison is a kind of operator. So I will take you know, the less than here. And then I have to figure out what is less than what. We'll go to variables. So we'll just drag x into the first block, block here, drag y into the second slot. So this condition is true if and only if x is less than y. Is that OK? It's impossible to make syntax errors because it's you know, drag and drop. You know, things that are not compatible cannot be dropped into a particular slot. So if x is less than y, then y would be the maximum in this case. So I go to variables again, and then I will say set, in this case, set variable y to, oops, I forgot one thing. I forgot to make z. So now I have to make a new variable z for this sprite only. And in this case, I will set variable z to the value of y. And since I'm lazy, I will take a duplicate of this, stick it into here. And this one will not use y, it will use x instead. 
like that. And I will go to logs again. And then this time I'll say, now this part is kind of interesting because I want um, the sprite not to only give me the number, but also in give me the number, but in a well formatted you know, manner. In other words, it will say the maximum of blah and blah is blah. Okay, but that turns out to be more difficult than it seems because integrating variables into you know, the text output requires another operation that we need to use. And I need to remember what is under the operators. Yep, it is. It's under join. So I will need multiple joins in this case. Now the join operation is just as the name implies, it is basically concatenation, if you will. In this case, it's going to concatenate hello with a space with world. In other words, when it prints it out or when it say it, it's going to be hello space world. So this, the, this is the most basic mechanism to combine different components as the output of what I want this program to uh, print out. So I would have to you know, print and change the text here and say the maximum of, okay? So this part is just literal, I can just type it. The next part is, <coughs> I need another join operation here. And the first part is the actual value from a variable. So I have to go to the variable here and drag x into this spot here. The second part is, you know, it starts with and, and then the space. Oops, I take it back. I need another join operation here. Because every time we have a variable, we need another join. So we'll need multiple joins here. So I would say space, and, and then another space. And then I need one more join. Drag it here. This one will be the actual value of y. And then I have another you know, join over here. But before I do the join, yep, I need a join first. Now you start to see the limitation of this approach, you know, dragging and dropping. It can get tedious. Okay, so here I would say is Instead of world, I would pick my third variable. You can see. So this whole thing will end up printing the maximum of, and then would use the actual value of x, and then the literal you know spelling of and, and then the value of y, and then the word is, and then the value of z. It's not that easy. Okay, it's just you know, very tedious because you know each join operation can only join two things. So we need multiple joins for this to work. And after this is all done, we go to control, and we scroll all the way down and say, OK, this is the end of the entire script. You know, we can stop here. And this is how you write a program using Scratch. No syntax. It's all drag and drop. But sometimes it can be you know, a hassle because you know, to print the maximum of blah and blah is blah you know, requires you know, multiple join operations. So I'm going to click the, uh, I would click this guy, and it asks me, give me a number. I'll give it like, you know, five. Give me another number, I'll give it eight. Press the enter key, and it prints the maximum of five and eight is eight. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so for your next homework assignment, I want you guys to implement the game of Hangman using Scratch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hangman Thursday, turns right? out to be, huh? Do it by Thursday, right? Do it by, do it by next, <laughs> this <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> <coughs> On Thursday, I suspect, you know, like about 10 people in this class would tell me, but I haven't installed Scratch yet. I don't know where to find it. <laughs> and then 20 people would say, I'm done. No, no. Now, Hangman is kind of fun because you can actually draw the Hangman by using the cost, the concept of costumes, okay? you can hang a cat, you know. But that's, I think, I think there'll be more people protesting if you hang a cat than when you hang a person. <laughs> <coughs> the entire, you know, um, animal cruelty, you know, anti-cruelty to animals, you know, community will be coming after you. I if you hang, just at the end, have a statement before you start the script, say no animals. No actual animal was actually harmed. 
But it's the idea to say it's okay to handle a cat that is wrong. We cannot even handle squirrels, you know, let alone cats. <laughs> <laughs> well, first you have to dismember the animal because you're not putting the animal on the hangman thing entirely. You're putting it piecemeal. <laughs> Which means you have to dismember it first and then sew it back together. Okay, so you can <laughs> you can save it if you want to. So you can go ahead and save the document. Um, you know, save your program. Uh, it comes with you know, certain programs already pre-installed. Okay, when you download this and install the program, it comes with certain programs, certain scripts already pre-installed. You can do all sorts of fun stuff. You know, I'm not going to spend any more time, but when you go to scratch.mit.edu, make sure your computer has Java installed first, okay? Because you know, all of those programs will run in Java. And you can see what other people have done. Um, you can quite easily make a game like this. Um, this is not a challenge. I'm just saying that you know, if, if you're up to it, you can actually try to do it. And this is actually considerably easier than the Hangman game. The Hangman game is actually quite complicated. Now what you can do is in the background, you know, the um, on the stage, just draw a path, okay? You know, just draw a path like this using a particular color. You can use a sprite to make a car, you know, like a little race car or Jeep or whatever. In, you know, initialize the initial initialize the program so the car is facing this way at the beginning point. And the whole objective is driving this car using your mouse. Or can, if you can, if you want to, you can also use the keyboard. There are ways for Scratch to interpret what you're, what key you're pressing, and the key is to drive this car without hitting the obstacle or hitting the walls, or do it as little as possible and get to the other end. This game is surprisingly easy to implement using Scratch, because it already has all the necessary stuff, the blocks to move, to sense whether you're hitting, you know, uh, touching you know, the, the, the edges, um, to respond to it. And if you want to, you can actually go to your car, you know, stick a microphone you know, next to the exhaust, you know, and record the sound of your own car, and integrate that into the game. It's actually pretty easy to do all of that stuff. You, know, you just have to kind of explore you know, the sound tab, the looks tab, you know, a few other tabs. Hmm? Then you stick it next to the electric motor. <coughs> you make, it makes a high pitch sound, right? <laughs> a boat still has a gas engine to recharge the uh, that boat. Yeah. Does it? Yeah. Yep. That's why the boat is a it's a self-contained you know electric car has a really big range because when you deplete the battery, it kicks the, the gas engine kicks in so it can either supply power to recharge the battery or also directly supply the uh, power to, um, to the electric motor. The motor is all electric. Okay. It's all electric, but it has a gas engine, just in case. It's a backup, ba it's ga it's a backup generator. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So do we have any questions about Scratch? No? No one seemed to be interested at all. <laughs> Wait until you get to the C and C++ programming class. It's not nearly as fun as this. <laughs> With this, you know, okay, since you guys are not interested, I am. Yep, go ahead. I had an idea to do a I had an idea for programming to scratch. But Halloween is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can make all sorts of stuff you know with, with Scratch because you can have multiple sprites. Now, if I want to make this you know uh, make this particular sprite uh, walk, it's actually surprisingly easy. You go to Control again, and I can use okay. Let's say this time I want to start the program when the green flag is clicked, which is this flag here. I can just go to Forever, so this turns it into an infinite loop. And I'll just go ahead and do something a little bit easier first. So I'll just say walk 10 steps forever, okay? So I hit the green flag, and it's not very interesting. It gets all the way here. Let me drag it back. All right, so the next thing I, want can, I can do is to go to looks, and I can use next costume. So for every step it takes, it's gonna switch the costume. It has two costumes right now. So when I run the program, now it looks a little bit more like running, right? Then I can put in a time delay. I can go to, I think it's under control again, wait, 
But instead of waiting one second, which is really slow, I can make it wait maybe 0.2 seconds, 200 milliseconds, and see how that works. Yeah, a little is too slow, but it's okay. All right. Now, what if I wanted to hit the wall and then turn back? Now, that gets a little bit more complicated because now I have to first detect whether it is hitting the wall, and then two, when it does hit the wall, it has to turn around. Okay. So that means I need a conditional statement to detect whether it's hitting the wall. So here I stick a conditional statement into the loop itself. And to, di to discover whether it is hitting the wall, I can use the touching condition. And then I can specify the edge. So when it is touching the edge, I can make it turn around. Turning around is really in motion. So I can make it turn around or point in a certain direction. Or point to work. No, that's not what I want. Oh, I can do everything without doing all this stuff here. Read the manual first, right? <coughs> if on edge bounce, guess you know, that applies to people too. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> do you see how easy it is to write a program <laughs> like this? Okay. So now what you can also do is you can make another sprite. <laughs> and you can make the bounce angle a little bit different because you know when it bounces, you can also specify to alter the angle a little bit. So every time it bounces, you know, it will bounce in a slightly different angle. And then you can detect whether a sprite is you know colliding with another sprite. I can show you exactly how to do that part too. It's really, really easy and fun. Um, I can create a new sprite. When you create a new sprite, you can either draw or paint a new sprite, or you can import one from a graphics file. In other words, you can take a picture of your own cat, delete the background stuff out of it, and then turn it into a new sprite. Or better yet, use a video camera, use a phone, okay? Be, uh, record a video clip of your cat, you know, strolling around, okay? And then go into a, um, uh, a movie editor and then take out the frames so that you can say, okay, if I want to animate the cat with like two frames per second, you know, these would be the two frames that I want, or several frames that you want. You turn all of those frames into costumes, and now when you change the costume with the cat, it looks like your cat is actually moving. But I'm, not, I'm going to do something a little bit less sophisticated here. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna draw a circle. That's my sprite. Okay. Not very inventive, but you know, it's a circle. All right, so now when I have the cat here, oh, I click the cat instead. Stop, okay. Okay, go back to the sprite. And then I can say, put the new conditional statement here. And I'll just put this guy here. Oh, no, that's not what I want. There we go. So I can go to sensing. Now this time when I use touching, it has a new option. I can touch the edge, the mouse pointer, or sprite two. In other words, the program has a built-in ability to see whether the sprites are touching each other. And when it does, you can use a conditional statement and say, oh, when they do touch, do the following. So let's see what we want to do in the following. We can go to sounds, and we can say meow. Okay. And we'll see whether it works or not. <laughs> and then here it comes again. So why is that so funny? It's just like that cat's getting water Okay. So can you guys imagine what else you can do with this program? Sort of, maybe? Can you make a Tetris game out of this? <laughs> Can you make a shoot 'em up game out of this, like Space Invader, with all the monsters you know, coming down? Why don't we just teach the class how to spray? The only reason why this is not sufficient for teaching this class is because it doesn't have subroutines. <laughs> it doesn't really have arrays either. It has a concept of a list, but not exactly an array. 
they are related concepts, but they're not, you know, exactly the same. So, but it is fun, okay? You know, it's definitely a lot of fun. And you can make, you, you can also have multiple, like right here, I have multiple scripts related to um, one particular sprite. I can have another program or other scripts related to this sprite too. So I can change this sprite's location. I can make it bounce around in a different way when it's colliding with another sprite. So you can actually write fairly complex programs um, using you know, Scratch. In fact, I would say that in this environment, you can write programs that are more complex than the homework assignments in CISP 360. Okay? The complexity comes from the fact they can write concurrent scripts that can run at the same time, and there are different agents interacting at the same time too. So you can actually make this even more complicated, you know, write programs that are more complicated than um, programs that you will write in the next class. Any questions about this? Does anyone want to take on the challenge of writing a, a hangman game using this engine? Okay. The one thing that you will need, <coughs> one of the operators that you will need, will be these two. Okay. Letters one of something and the length of a particular word. Those are the ones that you have to use because you have to scan through a word to see whether it has the letter that the player is guessing. So there are there there will be loops inside loops inside loops. You know when you write hangman using the scratch engine. <laughs> 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 the the only the only downside of using this to, to play hangman is you know the, the dictionary of words has to be completely self-contained within the program. There's no API to open up a dictionary or to grab words from outside of the program itself. Which I think is going to be a it's a chore. If you can open a file and read words from a file or go to a particular website or web page, that would make the program a lot more fun. Anyway. <laughs> so this is, I think this is a really good, you know, um, practice, you know, tool for those of you who are just getting tired of tracing programs by hand. <coughs> All right. So next thing is we want to take a look at the exam questions, but I forgot to bring along the questions themselves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'll probably be postponed that to next time, and I'll have everything graded by Thursday. Even if I don't sleep, I will grade them. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have to talk about the homework assignment, because it is available, so we'll go ahead and talk about this one first. Remember the, the pre and post condition thing? Turning in, turning in something. Um, actually, quite a few people got perfect scores. You know, I can you know, take a quick glance, and quite a few people got the whole concept. You know, and did everything correctly. Some people got a part of the concept and didn't quite get you know the other parts, and some people didn't have a good grasp of the concept. You know, at all. So you know, I left some comments. If you don't see any comments and only see like okay, ten out of ten points or twenty out of twenty in this case, you're doing good. If you see any comments, you know, you have to read the comments. And I think I left some comments like, you know, read my, you know, solution. You know, so in those cases, you know, people who got that comment should really study the solution itself and find out why the solution is the solution and why it's different from the solution that, you know, you, you turn in. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started with this one. It will all fit in one page. Most people who got your know, perfect scores, 20 out of 20, can fit everything easily within a page. All right. So what we do is we start with pre-2, because pre-2 is the precondition of line 2. And what should that be? Well, it should be pre-1 and the condition being true. x is greater than 20. Yep. What if you had just copied the pre-1 down to where you, where you put your answer? Just to so you, can do, you can do it that way, too. Okay. But I like to do it this way to explain okay. why it is okay. x is less than y and 2x is greater than or equal to 0. Right, I got you. Yep. 
So I personally will do it this way because this is really step by step, you know, because I'm not skipping any steps here. <clears throat> so, you know, as the second line, I will use, you know, x is less than y and 2x is greater than or equal to z and x is greater than 20. Yep. Are you screen capture? Um, I believe so. Let me double check. Yep, it is being recorded. So that's pre two. You know, no simplification is needed here. Um, some people, you know, went through the trouble, go through the trouble to simplify the middle part a little more. Like x is greater than or equal to z divided by two. There's no need to do it. You know, this is really just you know adding some uh, conditions to pre one. Okay. And you can do the same thing with pre four. You know, it's almost the same thing, except in this case it's pre one and the opposite of the other condition. In other words, x is greater than 20 has to be false in order to get here. I personally would prefer to say not x is greater than 20 first, and then you know change that to less than or equal to. So here I just use the you know, copy and paste. You know, two x is greater than or equal to z. And now this is the other interesting part is I noticed quite a few people use this symbol or this combination to mean less than or equal to. But in a programming language like C and C++, it really should be the other way around. Okay. So when you get to the C++ class, it will only take less than and then equal to, but not equal and then less than. Even though to us, it seems to be the same thing, to the compiler, it's not. So that's why in this class, you know, I did not deduct any points for people who use equal less than, but in the C and C++ class, it would not compile. The compiler cannot take that. Any questions at this point? Yep. Uh, say for pre two, mm -hmm. um, the pre one and x is greater than twenty. Do you have to put the line underneath it, or is the just that first line fine? Um, you mean just this line? Yeah. Is it okay if you just leave this that? No, you will need this line here because pre two is going to be used to determine what is post two. So you do need to explain what is pre one and spell it out. But I don't. I don't think I will take all the points off. You know, if you forget to put in the extra part. But it is important to put, in, put it in. Okay. So now we want to figure out what is post to. Now if you want to figure out what is post to, you have to check the list and see whether it is reversible. So you can say, you know, f of x is x minus 20 on line 2. It is reversible. So that the inverse function f prime now, I have the ability to use the, subs the superscript of minus one, you know, in a text document like this, but I'm just going to use prime, you know, just to be consistent with my own notes. So the, re in the re inverse function is f equals uh, x plus 20. Use the substitution rule. So I am looking for this particular type of reasoning. It doesn't have to be exactly in these words, as long as you can identify that it is reversible and what is the inverse function. And that's why you choose to use the substitu substitution rule. That's good enough for me. So it, it doesn't have to be exactly phrased like this. So once we know it is based on the substitution rule, then we say the post two is the substitution operation applied to pre two. We find occurrences of x, which is the variable on the left hand side, and substitute everything with f prime applied to x. And then we'll go ahead and expand what is pre two. 3, 2 is x is less than y, and 2x is greater than or equal to z, and x is greater than 20. We substitute occurrences of x by x plus 20, like that. And then after the substitution, one, one person forgot to take out the sub and then the parentheses, you know, and do the substitution inside. So after the substitution, we have x plus 20 is less than y, and 2 times x plus 20 is greater than or equal to z, and x plus 20 is greater than 20. There is no need to do any simplifications, although you know what some of these simplifications are fairly simple. Like the last one, x plus 20 is greater than 20 means x is greater than 0. But there's no need to do it, okay, if you don't want to do the uh, simplification, you know, this is just as good. Any questions up to this point? The tricky part, which I didn't really think of it as too tricky, 
is post 4. What is post 4? A few people use the forget rule because they think it is not reversible. It is actually reversible. So f of x is x times 1 on line 4. The inverse function f of x is x divided by 1. Right? Now, I know x divided by 1 is the same thing as x times 1, but an inverse function is an inverse function. Okay, If the function is f of x is x, then it is its own inverse function. There's nothing wrong with a function that can, is, that, that can be its own inverse. So in this case, the inverse function is really the same thing. So you know, I'm just you know, simplifying the whole thing here and use the substitution rule. And you already know what is the result of the substitution rule, right? After you apply the substitution rule, what do you get? The same thing, because you're substituting x with x. So, but I still want to go through this exercise here. x is less than y, and 2x is greater than z, and x is less than equal to 20. Substitute x with x divided by 1, which is x itself. So, as you can imagine, nothing really exciting is going to happen here. Copy and paste here. And some people forgot about line 5. Line 5 is important because that's the conclusion. I want to know what is the final conclusion of this entire conditional statement. That's why line 5 is important. It is the disjunction of post 2 and post 4. One person used, the and, used an and here instead of an or. Now that's also important because if you specify and, it means both post 2 and post 4 have to be true, which really does not make any sense here. It has to be a disjunction or or. And then at this point, you know, since we're all doing this using a, an editor of sorts, it should be no problem whatsoever to just copy and paste it. <coughs> so I am looking for the actual answer as, the, as this part. Post 4 and paste the whole thing. One person forgot to put parentheses around you know, the entire conjunction on one side and around the entire conjunction on the other side. It's okay because I did not take any points off because just like in arithmetic, we have uh, multiplication having priority over addition. It's the same way with uh, logical operators. And is almost like mul multiplication or is almost like addition. So without the parentheses, it will still use this particular order of evaluation. So those parentheses are kind of optional, but I personally like the additional parentheses just to specify the order of operation. Any questions about the solution of this particular homework assignment? <coughs> questions? I will save it into today's folder. And it's harder to find today's folder today because Persistent drive decided not to recognize itself. Find it. There we go. And now it's saved. Are there any questions about this homework assignment? I can also tell how much time people spend on it <laughs> because I got track changes turned on first you know, before you guys downloaded the file. So I was able to go to edit and then go to changes and do a show. And uh, it shows me, you know, it shows how much time it, t it took me to go from one step to the next. The time seems to be way off here because that's UTC um, and we are not, you know, in England or anywhere along that line. So that's why the time is a little bit off. <coughs> but you know, it's interesting to see how much time, you know, people how, how much time it takes for people to go from one step to the next. I didn't see one, you know, blob like, you know, everything is done within you know, one single step, which means somebody copied and pasted from somebody else. <laughs> I can easily tell those attempts too. <coughs> So I'm going to close this one, save again, and go back to our topics. Are there any questions? Good questions? All right. 
We are now going back to the binary search algorithm. Do you guys still remember the significance of the binary search algorithm? It's fast. Okay. It's fast. It is actually the fastest search algorithm. Okay. In other words, if you are given an array that is already sorted and you have to search, you know, a value, search for a value inside the array, this is the fastest algorithm. Well, says who, right? You know, how can you prove that something is actually the fastest? Well, I'm not going to do it in this class, but it is actually proven that there cannot exist any algorithm that can search for a particular value in a sorted array any faster in terms of number of steps compared to the binary search algorithm. That's a class that you will have to take as an upper division computer science class at a four-year university called the analysis of algorithms. This class is the design of algorithms. That other class is the analysis of algorithms. Which one do you think is harder? <laughs> the analysis one is harder because they will analyze not only for the correctness of an algorithm, but also analyze for the efficiency of the algorithm. How long would it take? How many steps? How many comparisons would it take you know, before the algorithm finishes? It will also analyze whether the algorithm will, will even finish or not. Okay? Because you know, just because you have an algorithm that claims to solve a particular problem doesn't mean it will even stop you know, with that particular algorithm. So there are all sorts of stuff you can prove and disprove in a, in a, in a class called the analysis of algorithms. It's a very dry class for some people, particularly people who do not like mathematics. You know, people, some people will find that class really hard and really boring and really dry, and others will find it kind of interesting because you know, it gives you a new perspective on algorithms. All right, so since we're not gonna prove the correctness or the efficiency of the binary search algorithm, we'll focus on what it is. We are not done yet. Remember last time we worked out, you know, maybe one half of the logic of that algorithm. So we'll go ahead and finish it today. Go to mouse pad and open the document from last time. And once again, I have to go to go through all this trouble to find it. This is the algorithm. I will resave the file into today's folder. No? Okay, this is where we left <laughs> off last time. Revision 6 was the last modification. We have identified the variables that we need in this algorithm. Variable B is an integer. It is the index of the first element that may have the value that we are looking for. E is a single integer variable. It is the index of the last element that may have the value that we're looking for. Because remember, in binary search, we start with an entire array. But every time we compare, we can shrink the region that can contain the value that we're looking for by half. But we can shrink by the beginning. We can also shrink by the end. And that's why we cannot rely on a single variable to tell us which part of the array may contain the value. We need two indexes to help us locate which part of the array may contain the, in the value that we're looking for. If you want to use the analogy of a phone book, it is equivalent of having two either post-its or, or bookmarks. Okay? So the first bookmark will start with the first page of a phone book. The last bookmark will start with the last page of the, of the, of the phone book. Every time you pick the middle page to do a one, one single comparison, you'll be moving the bookmarks. One of them will have to move so the two bookmarks will get closer and closer together. Is that making any sense? Is that kind of jiving with you know, how we understand the uh, binary search algorithm? So B and E are nothing more than um, bookmarks. K is the value that we're looking for, you know, the name in the phone book that we're looking for, and A is basically the phone book itself. Okay? And this is, what we, this is where we left off. You know, we know that we have to do some, something if the middle part of you know, the array is less than the value that we're looking for. And we also know that there's something else for us to do if it is greater than. 
The other else case here means they are equal. When they are equal, we know that we can get out of the loop because we have just found the item that we are looking for. So that's where we left off last time. I'm just to trying to bring the context back you know, so that we can continue with this algorithm. Are we doing okay so far with this? Now, we have a little problem here because every time you see a particular pattern you know, appearing multiple times, you should ask yourself, do I really have to copy and paste several times or is there a way to you know, kind of simplify and make this a little bit better? Do you see this expression several times? It appears once here, once here, and once here. It seems like it is something that we can you know, do something about and make it you know, not as verbose. So we'll go ahead and modify the algorithm just a little bit. Are you guys doing OK? We'll call this revision 7. And in revision 7, we're going to introduce yet another variable. So we'll introduce you know, variable m here. It is the index of the element that we compare with k. Well, it's, it's, it's both a simplification, but it's also a very useful algorithm. It, it's a useful variable to keep track of. So that means, you know, at the beginning of a loop, we can try to initialize m. What do you think m should be? It's the index of the element that we're comparing with k. A, isn't that the expression? Okay, so we'll just go ahead and copy and paste it here. And everywhere this expression appears, we can now just say it is just m, including here. Ah, very nice. Makes the program a little bit easier to read. Are we doing okay so far with this particular algorithm? We're not done yet. Okay, we have just identified you know, some variables, make the program easier to read, but we haven't really quite decided what to do with the branches in the inside the condition, inside the inside the loop. Okay. So we'll go ahead and make Another revision, this time it's revision eight. In revision eight, we'll start to think about mm, what am I gonna do here? The array is sorted in a non-decreasing order, or if you have unique elements, it is sorted in an increasing order. Can everybody understand the differences between a increasing order versus a non-decreasing order? The first one, when I say it is an increasing order, it implies that values cannot duplicate. Because if you can duplicate you know, values, then it's not increasing anymore. You can have two fives in a row. It's not increasing. When I say it's non-decreasing, then you can have duplicate values. Binary search will work with non-decreasing. It doesn't have to be unique. Okay. So if it is either non-decreasing or it's increasing, if k is already greater than a bracket m, which end am I going to move? Am I going to move the index B, or am I going to move the index E? Well, if A bracket M is less than K, so is A bracket M minus one close bracket, so is A bracket M minus two close bracket, and so on. So that means I can move the beginning of the range of the array that may still contain the value K, but how am I going to move it? The first, in, the first thing people want to think is to say, okay, we'll just move it to M. But that's actually off by <coughs> one. Why is it off by one? What do we already know about A bracket M? Can A bracket M be K? If I ever get here, A bracket M is known to be less than K already. So that means, oh, I can bypass this one too, the next one may have a value of k, but not this one. Is that making any sense, the plus one? Because by the time we get to this branch, we already know from the condition of the conditional statement itself, we already know that a bracket m itself k 
cannot be K. So we have to move on and say, oh, maybe the next one has this, the value that we are looking for. But that makes this one easier because this one is moving the end bookmark up a little bit, but not to M, but to M minus one. Are we making progress here? Okay. Because, you know, remember the, the picture? <clears throat> you have a huge array of values. You pick the middle one to compare to. Now, if the if this particular element is less than the value that you you that you you're looking for, and this is sorted in an increasing order, let's say this is the small value, and this end it would be the large values. If k is already greater than this value, then you can also say k is less than, greater than this value, k is greater than this value, and so on. So that means you know, the beginning, which used to be here, can now be moved to here because you know that this particular middle element is also less than the value of k. But this one here may be k itself. That's why we are moving b to basically m plus 1 because this is actually the index M. <coughs> yep, go ahead. So um, if we have 2,000 and we break it in half, it's 1,000 and we're looking for like 500. And 500 is uh, less than 1,000, so we're looking at the upper part. Mm, no, are you talking about the index or are you talking about the value of elements? about the value of element, so we're searching for like 500. Uh, if you're searching for 500, it depends on what is the value of this particular element. Well, overall it was 2,000. But we cannot, it's an array, we cannot say overall is 2,000. You can say it has 2,000 elements, yeah. but we cannot say anything about the value of the elements in the array. Okay, let's say it's 2,000 elements. Okay. I don't know how to build it up, but is there a prank? I think you have to. I think you have to think in terms of. There are two things we have to think about. One is the index, and the other one is the value of the element at the particular index. Okay. So I think you have to remember to separate those two concepts and make sure you don't con you know, mix those two into one single concept. Okay. All right, so we are pretty close to getting this algorithm done. And we'll go ahead and work on revision nine. Revision nine is you know, basically specifying, but how do we know that something is not there at all? Okay, that's the big question. Because we know B starts all the way up at the beginning. We know E starts all the way, all the way at the end. We know that after each comparison, we'll either move the end closer to the beginning or we'll move the beginning closer to the end. But each iteration will eventually, they will get closer and closer and closer. So now we have one particular, well, we have two scenarios to think about. What if they are the same? What if B and E are the same? What, is that, what does that mean? We have to go back to the beginning of B and E. What if the beginning, what if the first what if the index of the first element that has the value k is the index of the last element that also have the value k? The question is, are we running out of choices, or do we have one single element left that can be k? We have one element left that can be k. So when b equals e, we cannot get out yet because they are, we have one single element left to check. So what do you think, when do, when do you think we can get out? When B is greater than E. When the beginning has passed the end, then it makes no sense anymore. Right? Because the beginning is supposed to be less than or equal to the end. And that's why when B, which is the beginning, is greater than the end, then we know that, oh, there's no index that can fit this requirement. There's no index that can be um, that can be inside this range here because this specifies an invalid range, and 
that turns out to be the right answer. When B is greater than E, then we can get out of the loop. Okay, so this is my revision nine. And here comes revision 10, which is the last part of this entire exercise. So when we, when we talk about the design of an algorithm, this basically is what it is. Is the design of the algorithm is how do you step by step, you know, create an algorithm when you know how to do something by hand. Okay, so the last one is basically saying instead of using loop and loop, we kind of have to think about is this a pre-checking loop or a post-checking loop? That's what that's it. This, this is the last part we have to decide. What do you think? Pre-checking? Do we need at least one iteration for this whole thing to make sense, or do, can we do it? without a single iteration. We need at least one iteration, don't we? Because otherwise there's no M to specify the index of the element to compare to. So we have to make this a repeat until repeat until and we also have to specify the initial values of B and E. How should we initialize these two? B gets B is the index of the first element that have the that can potentially have the value of k. Okay. Before the first comparison, what should it be? A bracket zero. Mm, not a bracket zero. A bracket zero refers to the value of the first element oh. in the array. We want to specify the first element. Just a zero, right? Because zero is the index of the first element that may have the value k before the first comparison. And as a result, what should be e? Is the index of the last element of the array is bar a bar minus one. Minus one because we come from zero, so the last element has an index of bar a bar minus one. But we have one more little thing to fix here. Because this b plus e divided by 2 may not give us an integer at all. Well, just using the, the case that he was talking about, when you have 2,000 elements in the array to begin, to begin with, what is b in this case? 0. What is e? 1,999. According to this equation, what is 0 plus 1,999 divided by 2? 999.5, okay? Which is not valid as an index because it has a fractional part. So we can, we can fix that pretty easily. We can apply what we call the floor function. It's all in the notes, you know, if you read the notes, you know, the floor function is explained in the notes. The floor function basically takes, is the largest integer that is less than or equal to the value that is surrounding. That sounds really confusing. So let me just spell it out here. Floor of x is the largest integer that is less than or equal to x. Okay. It's well, it's kind of rounding down, but it's not exactly. Well, it is rounding down, but there are cases where it is not obvious what it will do. What is the floor of 2.8? Two, because two is the largest integer that is less than or equal to x, which is 2.8 in this case. Very good. What is uh, the floor of three? It's three itself, because three is an integer and it is less than or equal to itself. Very good, very good. What is the floor of, uh, let's try zero first. That's easy, because zero is an integer and it is less than or equal to itself. What is the floor of negative 2.2? is negative 3. It's not negative 2. Because negative 2 is not less than or equal to negative 2.2. So you have to remember to take one notch down even on the negative side. You have to you know, take a notch down and not a notch up. That's the definition of the floor function. Are we doing okay so far with the definition of the floor function? Um, but tech, I don't really like the floor. I like the ceiling better. <laughs> okay, 
can I use the ceiling function instead? What is the ceiling function, by the way? The reverse, exactly. The ceiling is the least integer that is greater than or equal to x. So you're basically always moving one notch up when you have a fractional sign. Either way will work. What if I, I pick floor sometimes and <coughs> ceiling some other times? It will still work. Yep. <laughs> it will still work. So in this particular algorithm, it doesn't have to be the floor function. It can be the ceiling function. It can either be, it can also be sometimes the floor and sometimes the ceiling function. It still works. As long as it is close to the middle, it works. Okay? You can pick either one, in other words. Because when you have four elements in the array, two of those are quote unquote considered the middle ones, right? And you can pick either one. The algorithm will work either way. All right, so the algorithm is done. Let's go ahead and trace it and see how it works. Okay. Now can we do this in Scratch? Yes, we can, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because if I do this in, in <coughs> the downside of doing this in Scratch or Visual Basic or any actual programming language is it doesn't leave behind a trace of how it actually works. It doesn't tell you exactly how M is going to, M, B, and E are updated with each iteration. In, some, in a class like this, I would say probably about 20% of the people can already go through this in their minds and understand how the algorithm works. But the other 80% will benefit from a line by line trace so that we are not only talking about the algorithm itself, but we are also reinforcing the concepts of loops, conditional statements, and so on. So I will trace this one, you know, for those of you who want to use Scratch, you know, go ahead and implement it in Scratch. <laughs> Let's go to office, calc, and you know, for the most part, I can actually remember the algorithm itself, so I don't need to go back to my own notes. Okay, so B gets zero. Oh, okay, this is, it's really troublesome when I cannot have my own profile because now I have to go back to, Autocorrect. Auto I think it's turned off everything. Oh. Except for certain ones. Um, turn off. Uh, oh, use the replacement table, but I have to fix it. All right, let's try this again. B e gets zero. Very good. B e gets bar A bar minus one. And then we have repeat. M gets the floor. In mathematics, the floor function actually has its own symbol. In other words, your math professor does not spell out floor. It uses a particular symbol. Can anyone imagine what kind of symbol a math professor would use to represent the floor of a value? Something that looks like a floor, right? So the floor of x looks like this. What about the floor of, what about the ceiling of x? Flip it up. Then you have the ceiling. Of x. So you have the floor and the ceiling of a particular value. And I'm not pulling your legs this time. This is actually the case. <laughs> Prove it. Somebody asked. Right here. <laughs> and I did not write this particular wiki page, okay? <laughs> so I did not rank it. Prove that. Prove that. Proving that would be much harder. It's hard, it's hard to prove that I did not do it because I could have signed in as a, using an alias, so it doesn't show as me editing it the last time. Now, this is also, you know, I'm sidetracking a little bit here because I know that this question is in the mind of all the professors. It's like, how can you trust Wikipedia when everybody can go in and change its content, right? 
Well, you can go to the history of the editing of a particular you know, wiki page. So it shows you exactly who made what change at what time. And if you want to reverse time, you can also click on the, the links you know, down there. And you can actually see the document before it is edited by that person at that time. So you can actually trace the history of all the editing. Um, with something like this, it's not very interesting, okay? Because the floor function and the ceiling function are hardly any type of you know topic of contention. It's not like you know people would argue and say, "Oh, I think the the floor function should be like this, or the ceiling function should be like this." But if you look up any political you know uh, wiki pages, then we'll start to see you know, like tons of editing going back and forth. <laughs> Um, and that's why I think in certain types of classes, you may not want to use Wikipedia as a source of information. But for anything that's technical, like programming, algorithms, math, and stuff like that, I would use it as a starting point. May not be the reference or the only source of information, but I would start with it you know, and use it as a, a starting point to look up something, because it usually has references to something else. The other thing that you also want to learn to use, you know, for especially for writing papers and stuff like that, if you need to refer to a wiki page, do not just point it to the wiki page, but point it to the edition that you want to use. So that, you know, so that, you know, when your professor, you know, wants to double check and say that, okay, is this, you know, is actually saying what you claim it's saying, they will go to the particular revision of Wikipedia that you are actually referring to, no matter how people edit it later on. It depends on the class. You know, I would say in networking classes, you know, those classes would be okay. You know, but in you know English writing classes, you know, probably not. So does that also mean they won't take YouTube and stuff like that? If someone you know, talks about something, you know, on YouTube, you cannot use it as a reference. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so if A bracket M is less than the value of K, then we move B to um, M minus 1, oh, M plus 1, else if A bracket M is greater than K, then we move E to M minus 1. And if I don't need to handle the other the other case because the other case the third case means you know it is not less than it's not greater than what can be left it equals to there's nothing to do when it equals to because the until condition will catch that and it will get me out of the loop but tech can't we do something like this you know else um, get out of loop and if Okay, let me let, let, let me fix the indentations first here so it's easier to read. So this is until a bracket m equals k or b is greater than e. I'll fix the indentation, then we'll go back and change the algorithm. And I'll explain why we'll change it. Because it seems that you know this is expressing the same logic here, but why can't we do it like this? What do you think? Because in an actual programming language, to express you want to get out of a loop, you have to either use a go-to statement or a break statement. Either one is considered a taboo word. So this is the last class you will ever hear the word go-to, the four-letter G word, and also break, which is the five-letter B word. Okay? But why is it bad? I mean, it expresses the same logic. You know, why, how can it possibly be, be a bad thing when it expresses the same logic? Well, when you have a simple algorithm like this, and you use either a go to or a break here to mean that, oh, it's time to get out of the loop, it's not a big deal. You can actually see it, and it seems pretty obvious. But what if the loop you know, spans you know, 20 lines or 30 lines, and, it's, and the go to out of the loop you know, part is embedded somewhere within a conditional statement within a conditional statement? It becomes buried, okay? Now, when something like that becomes buried, then it's no longer easy to look at the until condition and get a guarantee of, oh, what does it mean when I continue execution after this loop? With this program, the way it is written here is already bad. But if I take out these two lines, okay, rows, how can I get out of this 
particular loop. What can be guaranteed when I get out of this of this loop here? I can be guaranteed that a bracket m equals k, or b is greater than e. That condition is now guaranteed. But if I but if I use go to or break or anything like that the until condition can no longer be guaranteed because there are other mechanisms inside the, inside the algorithm that can get me out of the loop. And that makes the analysis of the algorithm harder. The verification of this correctness is also harder. And that is why go to is a taboo word and break is also a taboo word. Okay. There are times that you will be tempted to use those you know, particular statements because it just seems to make the program so much easier. I don't have to check the condition again and again and again and again to get out of a loop inside a loop inside a loop inside a loop. Okay, but you have to you have to fight that temptation because you know the moment you use a go to or a break statement is when your program will start to become difficult to maintain down the line. Okay. <coughs> A lot of these things, you know, you will not experience until you get out to industry and start to write programs that are much larger and have a lot more downstream consequences when they don't work. When you're only dealing with programs of a few hundred lines, you know what? You know, if you use break or go to, it's not going to break your program that badly. And it doesn't make your program that difficult to maintain, you know, either. But when you have to maintain programs that are of hundreds of thousands of lines that somebody else has written, and you introduce you know, more go-tos and more break statements, the programs will get really hard to maintain. I have the honor to have to uh, maintain programs you know, written like that with all the go-tos and whatnot. You know, in the end, I have to basically get rid of 500 lines of code to rewrite it to replace it with my own code because there was no way for me to track down you know, what it is supposed to do or how it is supposed to do it. So this is the algorithm, and then we'll go ahead, and, for, and it is probably best to also specify a conclusion here. Basically, it's, it's saying found is a bracket m gets k, because you know, this comparison will confirm whether you know, the element was actually found or not. All right, let's go ahead and trace it. So I'll use another sheet here. Window, size three. We got plenty of time to trace it. All right, so we have comments, my number, and then we have B, E, M, K, and then the array A. has to be sorted because binary search does not work when the array is not sorted. So we'll make it sorted. Two, five, six. Uh -huh. Oh. Eight and ten. Which value do, you, do we want to search for? You guys can A <laughs> six, uh, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> it will take one iteration. How about seven? Do you think seven is a tricky one? Okay. Well, well, we'll pick seven this time, and you guys can pick another one for your homework. Yep, that's going to be your homework. Your next homework assignment is to follow this algorithm. Okay. It's question mark, question mark, because all of these will be initialized in time when you get to that point. This is our <coughs> precondition. Okay? Are we good so far? All right. So we get to line one. Line one initializes B to zero. Line two initial, uh, initial, uh, initializes E to what? Bar A bar is what? Bar A bar is five. Five minus one is four. Okay. 
then we don't trace line three because line three is just a marker to indicate the beginning of the loop. So we don't, there's nothing to do if I were to trace that line. So the next line is line four. Line four is the floor of B plus E divided by two. B is zero, E is four, zero plus four is four, four divided by two is two. The floor of two is also two. Then we go to line five. Line five has to evaluate the condition. A bracket M is less than K. Uh, is that true or is that false? Well, let's figure out what is M first. M has a value of two. So A bracket M refers to A bracket two. A bracket two has a value of six. Six is less than seven is true. true. Very good. Then we go to line six. Line six says we have to change the beginning. So we change the beginning to M plus <coughs> one. The beginning is B. M has a value of two right now. Two plus one is three. And then we move on to line, which line? Are we done with the conditional statement? We took one branch, so the conditional statement is done. And then we get to line, line 10, very good. Line 10 has a longer uh, condition to evaluate, so I'm gonna leave myself a little bit more space here. A bracket M equals K. Is that true or false? It's false, well, we just did the comparison. Okay, so if the first one is false, this is a disjunction, I have a second chance to make it true. Um, B is greater than E, is that true or false? <coughs> B is three, E is four, so that's false as well. So we have false or false, which is <coughs> the whole thing is false. And then what do we do? This is a post-checking loop, we have to go back to the beginning. Because until specifies a, an exit condition, so we have to go back to the beginning, which is on line four again. So this time we have three plus four divided by two, which is 3.5, and the floor of 3.5 is three. Okay, so M gets three. Then we move on to line five. A bracket M, which is A bracket three this time, is less than K is what? Okay, it's eight. Eight is less than seven is false. So where do we go next? We go to the other branch, which is line seven. A bracket M is greater than K is what? That's true because eight is greater than seven. Then we go to line eight. It changes E to become M minus one. M is three, three minus one is two, right? Oh, it, yeah, M is, M is three here. Three minus one is two. Then we go to line 10. Line 10 will first evaluate A bracket M equals K. Is that true or false? That's false, but I have a second chance to make it true. B is greater than E is true. And we get to the line 11. We do have one line outside of the loop. And I forgot to allocate a column for that. Here. What should I put here? A bracket M equals K is false. It's false. <laughs> okay, let's let's take a look at this again. We have another, wow, one minute and a half to look at this. M has a value of three at this point. A bracket M is A bracket three, which has a value of eight. K has a value of seven. Eight equals seven is false. So that's why found as a variable will get a value of false. And then we get to post. You're all done. So your next homework assignment will be additional test cases for the same algorithm. Okay, so you just have to do the same thing, trace it, make sure you can follow the algorithm, update the variables. Is it already on? No, not yet. Will be up soon. And um, if you want to, play with Scratch and see if you can do this in, in Scratch. It's not hard at all, you know, it's just, you know, tedious. Especially putting in the dictionary. And Scratch can drop everything. Unless I can find some sort of pure text dictionary. I'm sure you could. Or a list of words.